Hello, everybody. Welcome to this TNT session sponsored by Boston Scientific. This session is about coronary access during and after TAVI, which is getting more and more important because we are treating younger and younger patients. My name is Helge Mollmann, and I'm here together with uh, three colleagues, Dr. Sondergaard, Dr. Alasnak, and Dr. Christé. And we would like to share some insights in this topic with you. The objective um, of this session is to understand the implications of coronary artery disease in TAVI patients, to learn about transcatheter heart valve implantation technique to obtain commissural alignment, and to assess the feasibility of coronary access after TAVI. The agenda is um, detailed here. So we start with a case presentation. It's about a patient with severe aortic stenosis at risk of developing coronary artery disease. And the case presentation will be given by Dr. Sondergaard. Next point will be a short talk about coronary access and PCI in TAVI patients. And I will um, give this a lecture. And then we will come to a case in a box um, with a recorded case with an accurate NEO2 valve with several points which we would like um, to discuss with you. And when I talk about discussion, it is very important that you take active part in this um, um, session. You have the possibility uh, to pose questions and we are happy to answer these questions in the upcoming um, live 15 minutes at the end of this session. With that, I would like to start uh, the session. And Lars, um, please give your case presentation on the patient you have treated with the accurate two valve. Thank you, Helge. So I'm going to present this uh, patient which was coming, who came forward with severe aortic stenosis. It's a pretty young lady, 68 years of age, normal body size. She got a medical history of arterial hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then, of course, aortic stenosis, and she was in functions class two when she was referred to us. Echocardiography revealed that she had a severe aortic stenosis with high gradients uh, preserved left ventricular ejection fractions. She has a routine underwent an invasive coronary angiography showing she had borderline stenosis, but nothing which need to be addressed prior to the procedure. She was in sinus ridden, no conductance abnormality. Her renal functions was normal and her STS score clearly placed her in as a low risk patient. She underwent a cardiac CT scan, which shows she had a pyramid of derived uh, diameter of the aortic annulus of 22.9 millimeter. Left ventricular alpha tract was in the same range. The coronary arteries had a good height. The left was taking off more than 12 meter above the aortic annulus and the right 16 millimeters. Sinus valsalva was white, 26, 29, 29, and ST junction was also good size, around 25 millimeter. We could see on her CT scans she had um, a severe calcification of a tricuspid aortic valve. Her ascending aorta was vertical, there was no horizontal aorta. And also we looked at the CT scan for, for the neck vessels. So we thought this was a normal anatomy with no severe calcification or stenosis. Access vessels was good size, no major calcification or tortuosities. So she was of course a, a patient with long life expectancy. She was discussed on the heart team uh, meeting and the recommendation to the patient was actually that she should go for surgical aortic valve replacement. But she denied that she wants to go for a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So we had to go back to the heart team and, and discuss which issues is there in patient like this. Patient of 60 years, 68 years of age and low STS score with a presumed long life expectancy. So we need to find a valve with good durability with low risk of conduction abnormality, with easy access to the coronary arteries, if that was going to be an issue in the future, and this patient will already have some degree of coronary artery disease. Also how to minimize the risk of stroke and also take into consideration that we did not want any vascular complications. So 
To find that, we need to have a transcatheter hardware with a large effective orifice area, which is, as we, from the data we've seen so far, is probably going to translate into a longer durability. Also about with low interference with the left ventricular alpha tract and the conduction system. A valve which could be aligned with the native uh, commissures. We are going to use a cerebral embolic protection device to minimize the risk of stroke and also to use a low profile interducer seat uh, to minimize the risk of vascular complications. So the procedural plan was to do it in local anesthesia without sedation, which is a, a routine in Copenhagen. It was a transfemoral access. We were going to use the expandable fortune friends eye sleeve. We use sentinel therapy and body protection devices as a routine, and certainly also in this young lady with severe calcification of her aortic valve. We were going to do pre dilatation using a 20 millimeter true balloon and thereby respect the minor axis of the aortic valve, which was 20 millimeter. According to the sizing, uh, we choose uh, a medium size accurate new 2 valve. And also we want to do an implantation where we align uh, the valve with the native commissures of the aortic valve. So let me just demonstrate some of the tools we're going to use. So first, the eye sleeve. So this is the eye sleeve. So it's a 14 friends sheet here. So it's going in in a low profile. And when you introduce your delivery catheter, it's going to expand up. So that will open up for more patients who can actually be treated by a transfemoral access. And this goes with all three accurate new two sizes. And finally, as I said, we're going to use uh, the newest generation of the accurate new valve, the accurate new two transcatheter heart valve which is a, and a very important uh, gut and enhanced ceiling skirt in order to mitigate uh, the degree of parallel leak after the procedure. So this is going to be the game plan for, for the case. Okay, thank you, Lars. Before we go on with the uh, life in the box case later on, I would like to share a couple of considerations about coronary access in um, TAVI patients. There are three major problems. First is coronary artery disease and aortic stenosis. How often do they come together? Problem number two, coronary, artery, um, coronary access during the type procedure. And last but not least, problem number three, coronary access after TAVI procedures. So coming to the first point, um, here you can see a couple of trials and the um, respective percentages of patients with coronary artery disease um, enrolled in these um, aortic stenosis trials. And it clearly shows that coronary artery disease is highly prevalent in the TAVI population and affecting up to 80% of the um, entire cohort. Therefore, it is absolutely essential to know how to access coronaries to treat coronary artery disease long-term after the initial TAVI procedure. Problem number two, coronary during TAVI procedures. So here I have a case um, which clearly shows how important it is to be um, aware of coronary problems during TAVI procedures. In this case, we just passed the aortic valve uh, with a wire. And if we then have a closer look um, on the coronaries, we can see that there is quite a problem just by wire passing. Um, there's a thrombus-like structure in the left main, and therefore you should be always um, prepared uh, during TAVI cases to repair coronaries if necessary. So nothing happened until, um, uh, beside wire passing of the um, stenotic aortic valve. And even this can um, already be a problem as you can clearly see um, in this case. However, there are more problems um, that you can experience during a TAVI procedure. And um, this is shown here. We have here a patient who was uh, prior treated with, the, uh, with an surgical aortic valve replacement and a very low uptake of the right coronary artery, as you can see here. And now it was uh, the aim to treat a um, restenosis of the aortic valve. And what has been done is to place a stand, a very long stand, as you can see in the middle um, image, um, deep in the right coronary artery disease, 
um, everybody anticipated that there might be a problem afterwards uh, when treating um, this aortic valve. And if we go to the next um, slide, you can see that um, indeed it was uh, necessary. So the stent was retrieved a little bit so that it just is in the ostium of the right coronary artery disease and then builds this typical chimney um, in order to overcome um, the problem that might be caused by the um, leaflet of the uh, surgical aortic um, valve replacement. So, um, this might be a um, possibility to um, overcome coronary problems during an, a procedure, during a TAVI procedure. There are other uh, possibilities like the Basilica technique, um, which we can um, discuss um, later on. Coming to the uh, problem number three, the coronary access after the TAVI procedure probably is uh, the most prevalent uh, problem. And I um, share here three um, images of um, problems after, um, long, uh, long term after the, the um, initial TAVI procedure. Um, on the um, very left side, a problem with the right coronary artery um, and um, middle and uh, right with a um, LED. And of course, uh, we have to find possibilities how to treat these patients um, as good as possible. How often does this happen? Um, I have a couple of um, trials here and uh, most of them date back quite a bit. Um, and the incidence of post-Tavi PCI was pretty low. It was 0.1% up to 5.7% depending on the different um, trials. And on the very left side, uh, the column um, out of our center, um, already seven years ago, you see this um, low procedure success of only 74%. And of course, we have to improve this. And there are different ways to improve the procedure success. How often do the patients experience, experience acute coronary syndromes? Um, here is a cohort of uh, close to 800 TAVA patients, um, which in the uh, next uh, two years, um, had a ACS, 78, per, uh, 78 patients out of this uh, close to 800 patients. So it's around 10% um, uh, of patients who experience an acute coronary syndrome. And it has to be made very clear, this is only two years. So um, if we go longer and longer periods, the percentage of course will increase. And this clearly demonstrates that this is a problem. And the problem becomes even more overt um, when, we are, when we have a close look on these results based on the serotonin experience. You can see on the left side, these are patients who are treated in the tarver arm, on the right side, the surgical arm. And where on the left side, there were a couple of patients, close to 20%, in which um, it was completely impossible to engage the coronary artery. This was not the case after surgical aortic valve replacement. It might be difficult there as well, everybody knows it, but it was possible in all cases. Therefore, um, this is really, this might really be a problem. I have um, collected a couple of details for the Evolute, the Sapien, the Accurate um, uh, Valve, and um, last but not least uh, for Valve and Valve cases, which I would like to share with you. And we, uh, I would like to start with the Evolute, and you can see that this is a very long valve. It's a supraanular valve, which might give us um, additional problems because the longer the leaflets are, the more difficult it is. And then there is this quite heavy mesh of uh, metal, uh, which may um, make, make it even uh, more difficult to um, engage the coronary artery. In theory, um, you can um, accommodate a 10 French catheter um, in, in the smallest cell of an Evolute um, valve. However, um, this is really theory. It, it's, um, there are a lot of cases in which it's already difficult to place a six French catheter. Um, it, it really depends on the rotation of the valve um, in comparison to the coronary ostium. 
And therefore, um, it is really important to understand on uh, how the device really looks like. And you can see the device from different angles here. And of course, um, it is very clear that um, the um, anatomical alignment may play a pivotal role in order to really gain access to the coronary arteries. If you have a look on the very right hand side, if you imagine that this part of the valve lies directly in front of a coronary ostrum, um, it is very clear that it might be difficult to bring the catheter um, at the right spot. And therefore, uh, we have to um, understand how much of the valve is below the skirt. And here's uh, the direct comparison on the left hand side, the Evolute on the right hand side, the Sapien valve. And um, it is pretty clear that the sapien um, is much shorter and that the risk that the coronary artery um, be li lies below the skirt is much, much um, lower. Coming to the sapien, um, again, it's a rather short valve. It's intra analogy sign, which um, makes it perhaps a little bit easier to um, gain access to the coronary arteries, as you can see here. However, um, although um, also this design does not guarantee um, that you're getting close to the coronary arteries. The Sapien um, 3 and the Sapien 3 Ultra are a little bit longer than the um, Sapien XT, um, which again makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, that's one point. And the other point is that everybody is trying to implant the valves as high as possible, which again may um, be a problem for, for the coronary um, access. Here comes uh, the Accurate, and the Accurate um, has a very special design, and you can see these huge, um, uh, the, these huge windows, um, which may facilitate um, to place a catheter in the coronary ostia. Of course, it's also a supraannular design, uh, which often makes it a little bit more difficult. However, there's close to zero metal um, in the area where the um, coronary oster take off. Therefore, it might be, at least in theory, easier. Next point is uh, Tavi and Tavi, um, which often occurred in the early days of um, um, Tavi because um, the first Tavi sometimes was too low or too high and we had to place a second Tavi. It may now become more often um, if we get patients back with a, a degenerated TAVI. And you can see that this might be a problem, at least if you go to the um, upper left panel, uh, where um, an Evolute in Evolute shows a very long um, closed cell um, design because the um, original, um, the original leaflets of the first device fold up and may, conc uh, may make it completely impossible to get to the uh, coronary ostia. Therefore, this might be a little difficult. It might be a little bit easier if there is a sapien in an evolute, um, as on the upper right panel. Um, however, there is not much of a difference. It seems to be easier in the lower panel, sapien and sapien on the left side, or um, Evolutin sapien on the right side, um, there might be a little bit, a bit, little bit more space in order to get the guide um, placed um, eventually. So uh, this Tavi and Tavi will definitely become more prevalent in the next years. And um, in this case, the stand frames of two prosthesis will overlap and the new stand will push and spread the previous leaflets over the original stand and thereby converting it into a covered stand up to the edge of the leaflets. And this can be clearly seen in the upper, uh, in, in the lower right image. This might be a problem and has to be taken into account. There are a couple of new um, trials around uh, which uh, had a closer look on the um, issue of coronary cannulation after transcatheter aortic valve replacement. One is the re-access uh, study, which was published a couple um, of weeks um, ago. And you can uh, see that there are distinct differences um, between the different devices. 
although I have to admit that the overall number of patients is not very high. So it, we are talking about 300 patients all in all, and um, the, the smallest group are, is only nine patients, the largest group 123 patients. But nonetheless, um, there is a clear trend that it might be a little bit more difficult with the Evolute R device, as you can see here. Out of the 123 patients treated with Evolute R, um, it was impossible to engage the coronaries in 22 patients. This was the case only in one out of 96 patients with the Edwards device and none of the patients with the Portico or the Accurate Neo device experienced um, any problems in um, coronary artery access. Nonetheless, this is not what we would really like. We would like to improve the situation um, already during um, implantation of the valve and this has been um, tried in the aligned Harvard trial and you can see um, I only have the, the image, uh, image for, for the accurate NEO um, here that you can try to um, find the perfect position and this has been tried either center back, center in inner curve, center in outer curve or center in front and in all cases the valve landed exactly where it should be. Therefore, the next point to know is only which one of these positions is best um, to achieve. And this can clearly be seen here. So if you, um, if you have the possibility to place the valve in one of the green points, namely center in the back um, or um, the center in the inner curve, you will end up with very low percentage of um, coronary problems afterwards, um, as you can see here. Um, um, it should be avoided to have the center in front of the, um, uh, the orientation center front, because this will give us most problems for both the right and the left coronary artery. Therefore, this might be a good option to further reduce um, difficulties um, during later coronary access. So a couple of take-home uh, messages, PCI after TAVI. PCI post-TAVI is still infrequent, but likely to increase with intermediate and low-risk patients, younger patients, which will have more time to experience coronary artery problems. Angiography and PCI in post-TAVI patients have an acceptable success rate with both self-expanding and balloon-expandable um, THOEs. It is of utmost importance to understand the THUE architecture um, for a proper selection of catheters and gear for therapy. Again, know your toolbox. Um, there are attempts for anatomical alignment, which are promising. Um, I showed you this for the accurate NEO um, device, but it's also possible um, with the other devices. The question on how should coronary artery disease and access impact the THV choice can be discussed afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention. So that was a great overview, Haley, about uh, the issue about coronary access. Um, so let's uh, move to this live in a box using the accurate uh, new two valve. So before we start, maybe Thomas, uh, I can ask you, what is the current role of using cerebral embolic protection device during a target procedure? It's really an important question because we know that uh, these devices are used in all patients in some centers, for no patient in other centers, but mainly it's probably used, let's say, selectively. And of course, we need to do more evidence, and we know we will have the ongoing protect Traverse study, including more than 3,000 patients randomized to the Sentinel device or just to the control group. And we start including patients in the last few weeks in the Protect Tavers study. But what we used to do before, we use it selectively and mainly in patients with suitable anatomy, in patients with higher risk of stroke, like heavily calcified aortic stenosis, bicuspid, also patients with some calcification in the aortic arch. And of course, in patients in whom the risk of stroke will be even more unacceptable, like younger patient, exactly like the one you, you will show us right now. Yeah. So, so I think it's, uh, as we're going to demonstrate, it's very easy to, to, to imply it to the patient. It's only add a few minutes to the procedure. 
it's safe, but of course we need some more solid evidence that it's actually going to change the clinic outcome for the patients before we're going to use it in everyone. So, so let's just see how it's actually deployed. First, I introduce just one, two centimeters. Goes fine. Okay. If there's no resistance, I just smoothly bring it further without too much. And from now on, I start fluoroscopy. There, the wire is coming. You hold the wire. Yeah. Yes, the wire is coming down. It's good. Then you keep it there in the descend uh, ascending aorta. Yes. And then, uh, all right. I'll bring this a little bit more forward, like this. Okay, you keep uh, some pull on the traction on the wire. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so now the device is good in place there. Yes. So that most proximal filter there, we will deploy by the first knob. It's a slider, which we bring back, like this. So that's in position. Next, we are taking the second knob which we rotate and then sometimes you also have to torque a little bit the handle in order to let it point to the ca carotid artery yes I think you're in that's good then I bring it to the carina okay now I bring it to the carina it's there we didn't trap the AL1 catheter which is also important and the last step is just where we push out this most distal filter. So that's it. Okay, good. So placing it, you see it didn't take more than 2-3 minutes. So we see there's a quite high gradient here. It's um, 82 millimeter mercury and maybe as important, we're going to look for the diastolic pressure in the aorta, which is 73 millimeter mercury and in diastolic pressure in the left ventricle, which is 23. We're going to use these numbers to compare with the measurements afterwards to a part of the assessment of PVL. So we're going to pace on the, on the guide wire, the left ventricular guide wire. And um, I'm sure quite a few sites have tried that. Normally we, we used to put a needle into the skin to pace on in the groin. Um, the advan disadvantage of that is that uh, the patient can actually feel it when you pace, there's muscular contraction. So instead we're putting a short guide wire into that five French sheet in the femoral vein and we can pace on that guide wire. That's uh, both more efficient and also it's more comfortable for, for the patient. So the second pace uh, lead is attached to the guide wire. So one here in the guide wire in the LV and one in the short guide wire in the left femoral uh, vein yep. so you can pace uh, we can pace 180 uh, so when you're ready Hannah uh, start pacing pressures down balloon up uh, balloon down and you can stop pacing so as I said before we're going to use the accurate new two valve so it, you can't really see a lot of difference from outside uh, all three sizes have an outer diameter of, of H in French. So we'll introduce it here through the ice sleeve. Okay. Somebody keeps hold on the wire. Okay, so this small introducer comes in or loader. And as it passed through this expandable eye sleeve, there's some resistance. You have to give some tension it to bring it in because, of course, it needs to expand up uh, from 14 to 18 friends in a diameter. But as soon as you're through it, it's, it's actually going uh, very smooth. Yeah, there's only very little mild resistance, actually. So now it's in, and I'm just going to bring our pressure back in just a second. Yeah, I see that strut there. So one advantage about this system is that it's it's really flexible. It will take tortuous anatomy, acute angulation in the aortic arch, and you can use it to get the coaxial aligned if you have horizontal aorta. And if you, if you just push it around the aortic arch, you'll see it, it often makes that small kink. Uh, on the stent frame because it's so flexible. 
and that's why uh, you can you can handle these challenging uh, anatomies. You see here, it just make that very nice bend and sometimes even a kink, and it doesn't interfere with the sentinel cerebral embolic protection device. So let's just break it. Uh, Haley was giving a very nice uh, presentation on how to take this uh, coronary access into considerations. So Thomas, how do, how do you see this commercial alignment uh, for, for current practice in Tarbo? Yeah, it's true that looking at the recent evidence we had, we know that we will do more and more low risk patients and younger patients with long life expectancy. So maybe 10 years ago, the focus on coronary artery disease and coronary access was not that high to what we have today. But it's true that today we have to do everything to optimize the access to coronary because your patient, she has already mild coronary artery disease and the probability to have PCI in the coming 20 years is very high. So that's sure that commissural alignment might probably, according to the recent paper especially, improve the probability to have easier access to coronary access. So I think that's something really that we have to add during the during the TAVI procedure and much more to what we did five to ten years ago. I, I fully agree. And Haley had already covered about the different types of uh, stent frames you can have. You can have a short stent frame with an internal position of the leaflets or a high stent frame with a internal position or superannual position of the leaflets. And particularly if you have a superannual position of the leaflets, it can be difficult to access the coronary arteries. We saw this uh, re-access study here, 300 patients uh, who had a, an, a go for uh, cannulation of the coronary ostium immediately after TAVI procedures. And actually in 23%, uh, 23 patients, 7.7%, .7%, it was not possible. And it was actually 22 out of those 23 patients was treated with an Evolute platform. So the Evolut was almost 80% of the patient where it was not possible to re-access the coronary arteries compared to only 0.4% of the other transcatheter heart valves. And one major issue is if you do not have commercial alignment, if your TAVI valve is not aligned with your native aortic valve, then you're going to have misalignment. So as you see here on the left-hand side, you can have the post of your TAVI valve sitting just in front of your coronary arteries. And it's going to be very difficult or maybe even impossible to do it. So ideally, we want to have commercial alignment, as you see on the right-hand side. We want to put the valve in the same way as the surgeons are doing, so it's aligned with the native aortic valve. And it's actually possible to do it for, for most of these valves. So most sites are talking about this cusp overlap view. Actually, you have, can have three different cusp overlap view, but what you mean about the cusp overlap view is that you have the right and the left coronary cusp overlapped on fluoroscopy. So if you look at the picture here, you see the small eye looking at the right and the left coronary cusp, so they're overlapping. So if you have this view, you can see the commissure between these two are coming out straight on the right-hand side of your fluoroscopy screen. So it's going to look like this uh, during the implantation in a cusp overlap view. And if you can bring one of your posts to the far right of your fluoroscopy screen, you know it's going to be at the commercial, you're going to have commercial alignment. And of course, you need to something to navigate from. And the accurate valve is quite easy to do it because it got one free stent strut. And that stent front strut is sitting just below the post of the commercial uh, of, of the transcatheter heart valve. So if you can bring that free strength strut to your right hand side of the screen, you're going to have commercial alignment. So you can see it here, this is a valve which is still undeployed, and you see, if you look very carefully, you can see one free stent strut opening. So if you can bring that to the right-hand side of the screen, and you can also look a little bit higher, you see one of the posts uh, isolated on the right-hand side, and the two other posts are overlapping each other on the left-hand side of the screen. Then you're going to have commissural alignment. When you have done your implantation, you can go to another cusp overlap view, now it's not the left and the right coronary cusp, but it's the right and the non coronary cusp, as you see with the small eye here. And in that projection, you're going to have the left main isolated on your right hand side of the screen, as the error here is indicating. And that's the way you can actually, after the implantation, check that you really have commercial alignment and it's where you have easy access to the coronary arteries. 
So this is where, where you, after incantation, you go from a left, right coronary cusp overlap view, you change to a right non-coronary cusp overlap view, and then you can try to engage the coronary arteries. And I'm just going to demonstrate it here. Yeah, so we do this rotation above the calcified leaflet. So let me, uh, typically we go, we like to go clockwise. Uh, let's see if it improves, I think. Now that free stent struts is, is almost exposed. And you can see the post-op also, look at, we have one on the right-hand side and two overlapping on the left-hand side. So here we're going to cross the valve. And one other feature with this uh, Neo2 is that you see this marker where, to, uh, where to, uh, to implant. You see that black dot in the middle, which should be at the level of the uh, bottom of the non-coronary cusp. Uh, this also improves, so it makes it easier to understand it. And as I said before, you see in this angulation, also the delivery system is aligned with the imaging plane. So you have both the delivery system and the three cusps aligned. So I think that looks like a good uh, position, and and uh, Ginzas will do the um, deployment. It's a two-step uh, knob number one, counterclockwise to open the top part uh, of the stent frame and go to the hard stop, and then we're going to reassess the position. It looks maybe it came a little bit down, uh, but but yeah, but let, let's do an angiogram and see. No, it looks okay. Yeah. So we go a little bit deeper. Uh, Gintas is taking the split out on the knob number two, and now when he's ready, he do he do the the deployment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can deploy now. Yep. Yeah. All right. Good. So we clearly have the stand holder which detaches from uh, from the valve. We also have commissural alignment there, so that's good. Now we still have that nose cone there, and I would say with accurate, it's really important to keep that uh, to keep that wire in your uh, left ventricle. Um, pulling more back, yeah, all right, good. We can go more to a standard LAO view here. Okay, I'm pulling back. Uh, now let's do an uh, aortic root injection. Uh, we can maybe take the a little bit more uh, parallax out of the. Yeah. Like this, and uh, we can maybe magnify once. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. I think that's. Um, should we do a post dilatation? So you see this patient had mild, maybe mild to moderate uh, power valve leak. So Helia, I think it's, uh, it's crucial for these patients to lead the cat lab with an optimal result, particularly if you're going to address a patient at a younger age and a low surgical risk, which could be a low risk both for surgery. So, so what should, how should we uh, tackle these issues? Lars, you're totally right. I um, would say that is absolutely crucial. And there are two points which have to be addressed. First is, of course, uh, the pre-dilatation, which you did perfectly. Um, in this case, uh, I would propose to go for a post-dilatation as well, because um, I think the, the risk of a post-dilatation is only very minor in comparison to this aortic regurg, which is still present. And um, I think the, the accurate uh, NEO device especially deserves um, um, post dilatations in order to get the best results. This might perhaps be the problem um, in, in the scope one um, and scope two trials, where a couple of patients um, still experienced um, aortic regurgitation afterwards, and this perhaps might have been um, not necessary with a higher rate of post dilatation. Yeah. I fully agree. I think you, you need to to go in with a post dilatation if you see a, a residual or you see power valve leak after valve implantation. 
and also hopefully in combination with this new two uh, with this ex with enhanced ceiling skirt is going to, to change it i think it's important to to really point out that post dilatation is not a problem sometimes it is reported as a minor result if a, a valve has to be post dilated but this is not the case um, i think we should really aim for the perfect result and for this a post dilatation might be necessary yeah, of course, Lars. I, I, I think you, you're right that uh, we speak a lot about treatment of, of PVL, of significant PVL, but also I think assessment is key. And that's also something we a little bit implement in, in our practice. It's sometimes to do two different view to be sure to give enough contrast also. And in case we have any doubt, we want to wait for the TTE evaluation as well, just to be sure that before we leave the room, we really optimize the result and we reduce the PVL as much as possible. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Great. I'm going to start. So typically for accurate post dilatation, we like to have the marker just in the in the middle of the those posts there, as you see, in order not to damage uh, the leaflets. So that's the position. Of course, we have to connect here again with the crocodiles on the wire. Okay, good. Look, yeah. Lahena. Start pacing. Pressure down, come up. Yeah. And stop pacing. Yeah. So it actually um, gave quite a a lot of expansion of the of the frame, I would say, from what we saw in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that did the trick. Uh, let's go back and and repeat the hemodynamics and the ortic root injection. And we see here before the procedure we had an Diastolic pressure in the order of 73 millimeter mercury. It's now 74, so slightly better. And end diastolic pressure in um, the left ventricle was 23. It's now 20, as I see it here. So that's certainly improved. So let's repeat the um, uh, aortic root injection. We can maybe do one Mac over there. Okay, so we just floor for a second. So, uh, yeah, okay. So that's, I don't see any parvalvular leak at all. And I think that's partly due to this new ceiling skirt, the outer ceiling skirt of this new two valve. Uh, and for the cases we have done so far, I think it's been the same here. We've really been excellent uh, with, with none of the patient having more than a trace parvalvular leak. So that's a big step forward with, the, with this valve. So this is that angulation where on the left-hand side of the screen, the non and the right coronary cusp are overlapped and then you have nicely the left coronary cusp on the right hand side of the screen and as you see we have obtained commissural alignment yeah. it's almost almost ideal it's almost overlaying these two posts on uh, on the right hand side of the screen so now we're going to demonstrate whether it's actually also give us what we want easy access to the to the coronary. So we're just going to engage um, the left coronary ostium here with a standard catheter. We have to come up beside, behind, yeah, like this, behind the leaflet, of course. And then I should walk immediately in, you see? Yeah. Okay, some content. So this is just, I mean, it, yeah, it took five seconds to get into the coronary. All right, so. So you see this commercial alignment makes it very easy to engage the uh, coronary arteries despite you have a valve with a super position of the leaflets. So now for the removal of the sentinel, it's very easy. It's just a reversal, uh, the opposite of, of placing it. First, you pull in the distal filter, like this. You bring it forward and you unflex. And then next, you pull in the proximal filter and it's out. So again, that takes a few seconds. Lars, uh, thank you very much for sharing this great case. Um, there were a couple of very important learning points. 
And um, I think uh, especially the, the way uh, you mitigated uh, the aortic regurg was very impressive with a perfect result afterwards. So congratulations again and um, give back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Elliot. So again, this of course is, is we, you saw some features here was, which is very important as we're going to move to these patients with longer life expectancy. Thomas, anything else you, you think is important as we uh, expanding target towards this patient population? Um, maybe just thinking if it's true that we, when we treat so, so young patient, low risk profile, I think one of the residual limitation of TAVI today is still the, the risk of conduction abnormalities. And it's true that with the accurate NEO, thanks to the small protrusion in the LVOT, we have the, the feeling, but also the evidence to say that the risk of uh, conduction abnormalities is somehow lower compared to other THV devices. So that's also, I think, a big plus when we treat uh, this kind of younger patient. Yeah. And I think we saw also from the two scope trial that the, the um, accurate valve gives you the same pacemaker rate as for, for the Sapien 3 and yeah. a significant lower pacemaker rate than with the Evolute platform. So I think that's um, important. Point, yeah. But maybe at this stage, we should open up for questions uh, from, the, from the audience. Okay, so we now ready to to answer some of these questions. So while we're waiting for them to come in, um, Helge, this cusp overlap view is it seems to take off in a quite a few sites. If you want to introduce it, is there anything specific you need to look up for? Is is there any risk of using this uh, this technique compared to the classical LAO projection? <laughs> Um, actually, no, I don't see a specific risk. Um, there are some cases you could imagine in which it might be a little bit difficult because you have to um, twist the whole system and um, you have to make sure that there is somehow a one-to-one -one rotation. And in case of um, very acute angles of, of the aortic arch, it might be a little bit difficult. But I never experienced any bigger problems. And um, if you see that the um, rotation don't follow your, your movement, you can easily stop and then go for, for the classical way. There is no absolute need to do it. It's more an add-on. So, so Mirvad, we, we have this uh, session is also about moving to patient with longer life expectancy, and there's a lot of issue we did not take into consideration when we started the TAVI program because the patient we were treating was elderly with limited life expectancy. But now we're going to treat patient who's going to live with this valve for a long time. So, in your practice, how do you actually make the decision how to to do these procedures in 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 patients? Uh, with longer life expectancies? So there are many factors that come into play. Uh, number one is operator experience. I would say that if anything is off standard, you want to make sure you have an operator with adequate experience um, to, to ensure um, you know, the least likelihood of having paravalvular leaks, um, you know, a high implant to, to ensure low um, probability of pacemakers, and certainly uh, the topic of today, which is coronary uh, access. Um, so I would start with that, with experience of the operator, and then there's obviously patient factors. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at the STJ junction, for example, uh, and, and the height and so on, um, once we start seeing that these factors are less than ideal, I think it's time to go back to the drawing board, have a discussion once again with the patient uh, in terms of risk and the surgeon. Perhaps it is time to readdress surgical ABR at that point in time in younger patients. Um, and, you know, you presented earlier in the session today that, you know, ACS can happen in approximately 10% of patients within the first two years post TAVR. Keeping all of that in the back of our minds, I think ultimately it's patient-centered decision that we have to make, and it isn't just about TAVR. Yeah. So again, I mean, uh, and also this was what we demonstrated during this case. It's, it's actually possible for, for some of these transcatheter heart valve, particularly the accurate valve, to have commissural alignment, which I, I personally think we should consider that in every single patient we're treating, particularly with the patients with uh, pre-existing coronary artery disease. So let's say this patient is going to, um, uh, to have access to the coronary arteries for the next 10 years, and, and then the valve will degenerate, and you need to do a valve-in-valve -valve procedure in, in this case, Helia. Do, do you see uh, 
is it still will it still be possible to access the coronary arteries? Yes, it is actually, and there's been some publications, um, actually a publication earlier this month uh, in Jack Interventions that addressed this. Uh, and I think what we do need is just to evaluate these patients a little more carefully. So perhaps evaluating the CT angiograms and so on and, and ensuring that we can access them. I think one thing we don't talk enough of about is the metal to vessel ratio. And the good thing about a valve that you implanted today, the accurate NEO, is that the vessel to, um, or the metal to vessel ratio is actually very good um, and allows even novices to a large degree use standard catheters to go ahead and engage um, these, these coronary arteries. So, so maybe, I think, I think you're fully right, but maybe for people who, who don't use that uh, algorithm in their practice, can you just, in a very simple term, explain what you mean with it? Right. So, you know, you look at the dimensions um, of the STJ junction, you look at whether you were able in the initial implant to have the alignment that you were talking about, the cusp alignment, um, and take into consideration all of these factors. Um, the other thing is the gradient that you have and the size of the valve that is already implanted. And so usually uh, superannular implants are, you know, generate a better, a better gradient. Um, when you put in all of these factors, it probably helps you make a decision of which valve you want to implant in a valve in valve uh, case. Mm. I think those are the primary factors that I end up looking at. Yeah, yeah. And also, we, yeah, it is going to important um, for, for the very first valve already because um, if you have a, um, a very shallow ST um, junction, um, it might not be the best idea to go for a supra annular valve because uh, this will definitely end up in problems um, once you have to do a valve in valve procedure. So it's, it's not only um, for, for the valve in valve procedure itself, it's already uh, the um, first implantation of a valve that you have to take care whether this patient is at especially high risk for coronary artery disease or um, not so to, to, to really find the, the perfect um, uh, way for the patient. But also if you just one comment to that uh, with the valve and valve, uh, we know that for the surgical valves, uh, some of these have a high risk of uh, coronary occlusion and and what we used to do was to do this uh, chimney stenting, placing a stent from the left main into the, the sinus of a salva. But now it's more common to use this basilica technique where you do a laceration of the surgical leaflets before implanting a tavi valve inside. And it's actually, it should be possible to do the same uh, for a tavi and tavi procedure to do basilica uh, laceration of the leaflets in front of the coronary arteries before you do the second tavi implantation. But of course, if that should work, you need to have commercial alignment. So I think commercial alignment comes into place uh, not only now, but also in uh, during the later um, intervention in these patients with longer life expectancy. Hell yeah, uh, we saw this case uh, um, had very uh, little PVL after implantation, maybe a mild and after post dilatation that was not. And that's actually the experience we got with this uh, new two valve. Uh, is that the same in, in, in Dortmund? Absolutely, um, absolutely. So we often have um, the experience that there is a, a little bit of a regurg after the implantation itself. And um, there are two ways to, to react. So the first way is just to wait for a couple of minutes uh, we all know that the um, accurate NEO2 has not a very high radial force, but of course there is radial force, but it may just take a little bit longer um, until the valve um, has fully molded to the native annulus. Uh, that's the first way. The second way is, um, of course, the post dilatation as you did in your um, case. And um, I think this was a really great um, case because there is literally no leak afterwards and uh, this post dilatation is not a big deal so often um, the physicians are a little bit afraid of post dilatations but if you know exactly what you're doing if you have a good technique a good team which which works hand in hand i think there is absolutely no big deal with, with the post dilatation and you should go for it yeah and, and I, I, I would say that this um, talk about uh, the accurate new have more parallel league coming out of the scope one and scope two trial. 
I would say if you handle this patient correctly with proper pre-dilatation and post-dilatation, and also remember that uh, in the scope trials, it was the first generation accurate new that which was used, not the current version accurate new too, but this um, uh, enhanced ceiling skirt, you're going to have the same rate of parallel leak uh, as for the other valves. And, and we see that, uh, we saw that also in the CMARC uh, data from, from the accurate new tribe. But, but let's just go back to the scope one and scope two trials because PVL uh, was one of the things people was looking at. And as we discussed, it's certainly much, much better now with the accurate new two valve and also if you handle it, it better. But Haley, there's, there's other considerations that you need to take into con to your decision when you choose a valve. Um, the hemodynamics, pacemaker rate, uh, conductions, uh, uh, conduct, uh, pacemaker rate. What, what, what is your take home from, from these two scope one and scope two trial? I think the, the uh, pacemaker rate is quite important and uh, the pacemaker rate is, is classically low with the accurate um, device. Um, especially if you treat younger patients um, who might have a longer life expectancy and therefore a longer risk for pacemaker-induced um, um, complications. In these cases, you really have to um, take this risk into account. So if you have a, a pre-existing right bundle branch block, for instance, um, you should really go for a valve uh, with a low pacemaker rate. And um, the same holds probably true with the for, for the hemodynamics. So um, especially patients with very small, tiny annular sizes, um, they might um, definitely um, benefit from, from a supra annular valve, which um, usually gives them um, single digit gradients after the procedure in comparison to a more um, intra annular design, which just does not have the, the place which might be necessary to yield a perfect gradient. Yeah. And I actually think, as, just as, you, as you said, that in the SCORE 1 trial, we saw that the pacemaker rate from, for Accurate was exactly the same as it was from, from Sapien 3, which is often regarded as the valve with the lowest rate of mm -hmm. conductance abnormality. And from the SCORE 2 trial, we saw that. Uh, the effective orifice area and um, and the rate of uh, patient prestige match match was the same for the ACRAD for as for the Evolute platform, which people said had got the best hemodynamic uh, performance. So I think it's 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 a very good value in in, in most of these issues addressing uh, these important things, particularly as we're going to move to patients with with longer life expectancy. So so just um, we are. Closer, getting close to the end of this session, uh, Mirvad. So, so how do you see uh, the accurate new two valve uh, in your program? Is it going to be for selected patient, or can you use it as a, how should I say, a working horse uh, treating most of these patients coming to your clinic? Um, I think the the second the second generation valve addresses an important point which you've just been discussing, which is the paravalvular leak, and that really was the driver. Uh, for most of the events in the scope uh, series, um, and, and it's being addressed. Um, I think for our patients, the ones who have small uh, femoral vessels, the ones who would have small annuli, uh, ones where we have concern accessing the coronary arteries, this really is the go-to valve. Um, you know, you can easily anchor uh, even in horizontal aorta, which we do see in our population. So there are niche populations where um, this kind of a valve actually does address it. I mean, having the crowns, um, that anchoring crowns deploying first actually helps in these kind of subsets of patients where you can control the positioning, which is often an issue with self-expanding valves, actually. Yeah. So I think we're going to, to wrap up this session. Um, I hope you uh, got uh, the understanding that as we're moving to patient with longer life expectancy, we need to set the threshold of the amb ambition even higher than we used to do. We have seen in, and discussed here how you can use cerebral embolic protection device. It's only add a few minutes uh, to the procedure and will reduce the patient's risk for, for a stroke or TIA during the procedure. You're seeing that um, we can treat even more patients by a transfemoral approach using these new sheets um, as you saw here with the eye sleeve expandable sheet and and we know that if patients have a transfemoral procedure the outcome is going to be better and very importantly 
Aquat valve is going to give you some important options for coronary access in the future, low rate of conduction abnormality, um, some of the superior hemodynamics, and also with the accurate new two, you see that the pacemaker rate is at the same range as for, for the current leaders in the class. So I want to thank uh, you, Mirvat, Helia, and Tama for, for doing the session together, and for you who attended the session, and hope you enjoy the rest of the PCR Valve e-course. Thank you.